understand the culture of the time and unless you understand certain things, it's not going to mean the same. For example, the book of Hebrews was written to who? It was written to the Jews, right? It was written to, to Jews who had become New Testament Christians. Why was it that the, 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 the Hebrews was uh, written to the Jews? They could understand a lot of what was going on in the book. Now, does that doesn't mean that nobody else could read it. No, we read it. We're not Jews. We were ne we've never been Jews. We read it. We can understand it. But the people that were reading it, the Jews that were reading it, could understand a lot of it because that was something that they grew up with. The idea of the priest, the idea of the temple, the idea of all of these things, the way it was written was written it, with those people in mind and their understanding of history and their own background. Uh, for example, uh, Matthew and uh, uh, John were written by who? Jews. They were written by Jews. Luke and Mark were written by Gentiles. They were written by people who were understand the Greek. Though, the, the, if you look at the way that those were written and to the people they were written to, the terminology and the phraseology is used differently in each of those books, each of those four books. So this idea of interpretation, is not, there's nothing wrong with interpreting the Word of God. We have to be able to interpret the Word of God, okay? But it is a science. Um, Acts chapter 8, verse 30. Somebody read that for me. Acts 8, verse 30. And we, we look in here at Acts chapter 8 and verse 30. This is the theme of hermeneutics. Acts 8 and verse 30. Whoever's got it, go ahead. Yeah. Try again. 8 and verse 30. 30. <laughs> 8 verse 30 <laughs> well you start reading I'm thinking okay I think we're going to have to go back to the scriptures 8 verse 30 go ahead you got it okay so there's our theme of hermeneutics why must we interpret do we understand what we're reading? Listen, there are many people who have read the Bible, but they couldn't tell you the first thing about it. They read it like they read anything else. They read it like we would read, you know, uh, Tom Sawyer, or we would read To Kill a Mockingbird, or any of the, any of the great literature of our day. They read it in the same way. They're, lo they're not looking at it in the way that God wants us to read the Scriptures. Uh, I, I, it's, not a, it's not a novel to be read and then put down, and then maybe 10 years later you want to revisit it. It's a, it's a thing that is to be read and studied. It's to be digested. Uh, you know, that, we think about that. The idea, if you remember in the book of Revelation, it talks about he gave him the book, and he ate the book, and on his tongue it was what? Sweet like honey, but it went into the belly, it was bitter. So the idea here is that the Word of God is to be eaten little by little and digested, and you know what? Sometimes it's going to sometimes it's going to be sweet to us. Sometimes it's going to be bitter because it's going to it's going to confront us in a way that we're not used to being confronted. Okay. So, the theme of hermeneutics is basically this: Do you understand what it is you're reading? That's our that's our theme. But it is a science and it is an art and it's got skills and it's got principles behind it. And we're gonna we're over the over the next several weeks we're gonna learn a lot about what it means to interpret the Word of God. Because, you know, a lot of times people come up to me and say, Chuck, I don't understand. What does this mean? You know, look at, look at what it says here. And they, and they go through the verse. And, of course, I may have studied that verse a little bit more. So, to me, I look at it and go, you know, I, I don't say it out loud, but sometimes I think, do you, why, why do you not understand this? But then I have to stop and realize not everybody has read every single portion of the Scripture. I have, there's some parts of the Bible that I still, I get people on the phone or I email and say, what, when it says this, what does it mean? Guess what? They've, they've learned that part of the Scripture, and they helped me work my way through it so that I can learn it a little bit better. All right? So, there's a couple of things that we need to learn about hermeneutics and the way that we go about reading the Scripture. Uh, this is The next two points I'm going to tell you are, are a lot of what we learn in regards to learning how to preach, but it, it applies equally as well to somebody who might be studying the Scriptures. Okay? There's two things. Uh. Ah. 
Okay, we've got eisegesis and we've got exegesis. And I'm not going to complicate everything with Greek terms, but these are two Greek terms that really help, are helpful to learn when it comes to interpreting Scripture. Okay, there's eisegesis and exegesis. Um, let's, look, let's look at this one first, exegesis. The, 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 the first part of that, exo, tells us what? It's on the outside. The, the idea here is this. When it comes to exegesis, exegesis is the good one, all right? So here we've got, we'll go ahead and, we'll go ahead and put this in. This is the check mark. This is what we want. This is what we don't want. Exegesis means simply this. We draw the meaning of the Scripture out of the Scripture itself. We look at the Bible. We look at the Scripture. We look at what the verse means. We study it in all the ways that we possibly can, and then we draw the meaning out of it. That's important, especially when it comes to preaching the Word of God. When, we're, when I stand up here, if, I, if you understand exegesis means to draw the meaning out of, what does eisegesis, as, out of necessity, what does eisegesis mean? The opposite. It means what I do is I have a predetermined point that I want to make, and I make a scripture mean what I need it to mean. Is, you see the problem with that, right? Okay? How many times have you seen somebody take a verse of scripture that means nothing what they're trying to say, but they take a meaning that they already have in their head, and they make a portion of scripture mean what, it's, what they want it to mean? That's, that's very much an idea of resting the scripture. So I'll give you an example. How many times have you heard this interpreted? What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Where do we find that? What is, in, what is it in regards to? The Lord's Supper, okay? How many times have you heard people say, see, this means that we should not eat and drink in the, Lord's church, or in, the, in the church building, not the Lord's church, in the church building. I've had people that stand on that as a matter of doctrine. You are not to eat or drink in the building that the church meets in. What, have you not houses to eat and drink in? Now, if you didn't know the scripture, if you didn't know the meaning behind the scripture, you could certainly take that and mean what you want it to mean, right? Here, here it is. The Bible says that you're not supposed to eat and drink in the house of the Lord. Now, never mind that this is not technically the house of the Lord. This is just a building. But you have people that will take that eisegetical and they will make the scripture mean what they want it to mean. Now, as an exegete, that's just somebody who uses exegesis. If you do that, you're an exegete. When I preach, I'm an exegete. I look at the scripture, what does it mean? I draw the meaning out and I present it to the, to the congregation. As an exegete, what would we do with that particular verse of Scripture? Read it. it yeah, it, it, it means what it means. The Bible means what it means. It, it, it's not dependent on my. It, it, it's not dependent on my interpretation of it. I have to make sure that I interpret it correctly. It doesn't. De the Word of God does not depend on my interpretation. The Word of God stands alone. So when I look at that particular verse of Scripture, I say, "Okay, all right, this is what I need to do." I need to read it in context, right? I can't just read that, take that one verse, because you notice that's what they do. They take the one verse, and they pull it out of the scriptures, and they say, you see, this is what it means. Now, I have to read it in, con in context of what it's being used in. For example, the Lord's Supper. It doesn't have anything to do with, if, while I do not consider this an, a, a, an acceptable thing, doctrinally, doctrinally, there is nothing wrong with bringing in a drink or even an article of food and sitting here and eating it while the Lord's assembly is going on, doctrinally. Is it a good idea? No, it's not. It can cause confusion. It can cause issues. But doctrinally, it's not a problem. So what do I have to do? I have to look in the context in which it was used. I have to look at what was going on in that, in that, um, in that congregation at the time. I have to look at who was writing it, why they were writing it, and you think, well, that's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. The, work the, the studying the scriptures is work. You know, we talked about labor this morning. It's, it, we are not, we do not sit back and passively allow the scriptures to be used. We do not passively allow the word to be used. It has to be an activity on our part. We have to do something. And we can't say, well, I read the Bible this morning. Well, what did you do? Well, I read it. Well, did you study it or did you read it? Well, I read it. Well, is it all very well and good to read the scriptures? Sure. Is it better to study them? Yeah, that's what we're supposed to do. We study to show ourselves approved. Not just read. We study to show ourselves approved. Okay, so we've got eisegesis, which means to put in. We put into the verse that which we want it to mean. Exegete, we draw out. 
That's the good thing. We draw out the meaning. And it takes a little bit of work, but it's, it's well worth it. We take the message from the Word. So we should be all exegetes. That's what, we should, that's what we need to be when we call ourselves students of the Word. We're exegetes. Okay? Uh, some may turn to Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. Who's got that? All right. Read uh, verses 1 through 8, please. <laughs> Hold it right there. Hold your place. What can we gather from being exegetes? What can we draw out from that? One thing is this. The people did not have, not everybody had a copy of the law. So what had to happen? They had to draw out, they had to bring out the book of the law that was held in a sacred place in the temple, and it was kept there safely. This is before, Remember, this is well before the Torah, well before the, the portable uh, the portable scrolls that were taken to each of the uh, each of the synagogues. This is when the temple reigned supreme, and the book of the law was kept in the temple in a safe location. So the people did not have a copy of it. So when they wanted to hear from it, they had to bring it out, which was big deal. For them to bring out the book of the law was a big, big, big deal. So they would bring it out, and they would make this big presentation. Okay, and continuing on. That's right, just... Okay, so what we get from that and all these names, uh, for one thing we know that the people did not have a written copy of, everybody didn't have a written copy of the law. So how was the law passed down? Right, it was an oral tradition. The law was oral. You notice that the men were told they were supposed to raise up their children as they, in all parts of their day, no matter what they were doing, no matter what the circumstances were, they helped, the, they helped their families understand the law. So it was an oral tradition. They heard the law, they, they kept it in their hearts, and then they would give it to their children. They would write, recite it to their children. So here we have Ezra, and he's out there and he's doing what? What is he doing here? He's reading the law. Now think about this. It says he started from morning, which was 6 o'clock, until midday, which was what? 12. So for six hours, the people stood and listened to this prophet deliver the word of the Lord. Now, why did they do this? Ezra is requested to read the law to the people. And it is so the people could do two things. One, they could hear, they could hear the word, and what else? They could understand okay so as that word is being read when people had questions what did they do they, they, they helped them understand the word of the Lord they explained it to them it's like anything else if you don't understand something do you remain in ignorance not if you're smart here you have here you have the, the, the keepers of the of the word up there the prophet of the Lord are you going to ask him you know the questions absolutely you're going to ask him anything that you need to know I explain this a little bit more clearly to us. We don't understand this. Um, and, and this is what's going on. 
It's the same thing as we do today, folks, is it not? Okay, as Christians, what do we do? Why do we present the word of the Lord to people? So that they can hear it and they can understand it. We have the role of Ezra. That's our responsibility. Now, we don't have to stand up and preach for six hours. I don't know anybody could handle that. I don't know if I could handle that. Um, I was, we sang yesterday for an hour, and I thought my voice was going to give out. And I thought, well, you know, I better rest it because I've got to come up here and do it again for a couple hours. And then in class, so, you know, this is a guy who's reading for six hours, but the whole point was so that the people could hear the word of the Lord and could understand the word of the Lord. All right? If, if, yeah, if, if it was a matter of what does the Lord want us to do, we don't have anything, that might be a different story. If we're truly looking out for what God wants, if we're looking for what God wants from us, yes. You know, there are, you know, you know it says that all, all the people, it doesn't mean every single person. There are people who said, I don't want to hear the word of the Lord. They went about their daily business. They didn't had no desire to go and listen to a man speak for six hours. Those are people that didn't want to hear God. Are we going to run into that today? Of course we are. Of course we are. And we're living in a we're living in a country uh, we're living in a country that's not like the nation of, of Israel. The nation of Israel, everything about them was about the word of God. Not so us. Yeah, you know, we have a secular part and we have a religious part of our country. And there are people who do not want to hear the word of God, and there's nothing we can do about that. We can we can present it to them, we can try to get them excited about it, but that's may or may not uh, fall into where it needs to be. Okay? All right. A couple of things that hermeneutics uh, involves. One and I know a lot of people don't like to hear this, it involves an analysis of the original language. Now, does that mean that every single person in here needs to go to get a degree in Hebrew and Greek in order to understand the Word of God? Certainly not. Certainly not. That's why it's translated. And you know what? For the most part, for almost, for, uh, uh, with almost certainty, when we read the Scriptures of the Lord in a translation that can be trusted, and we, I'm going to get into that in just a couple minutes, when we look at a translation that is generally accepted, we are getting the word of the uh, word of the Lord translated as best as they possibly could, and we, when we read this, we don't see anything that's in, in contradiction to anything else. Now we do have to be careful about which in, which translations we use. There are some that I would not give you two cents for. There are some that you wouldn't even have to pay me, and I'll I'll get rid of them. They're just not good. Uh, they they break the word of the Lord into um, catchphrases. Uh, it's not a true translation. It's just sort of a off the cuff. Um, you know, using a, a, a modern, yeah, it's, it's sort of, you know, this is kind of what he meant. You know, that's not what we want. We want a genuine translation where they took the word of the Lord and they parsed it. They said, this word means this, 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 and this. But we have to remember that when we study, hermeneutics involves an analysis of the language. Okay? So we've got how many different languages? We've got Hebrew, we've got Greek, and we've got Aramaic. All of those are involved in the word of the Lord. Luckily, guess what? Somebody's already done that work for us. Some good, good men have taken that, those languages and looked at the meanings and said, this is what we can mean. This is what, it, this is what, the, this is what that phrase means. This is what that word means. This is what it was talking about. Okay? So it involves analysis of the original language or the earliest available form. You know, th did you know that the, the, the um, uh, fragments that we have of the word of God are not the original ones? They are handed down, they are, they are copies of copies of copies of copies. You know what? In spite of that, not one of them contradict the other. Not one of them. If the, if the Lord was not, did not have a hand in how that, was, how that came down to us, we would have fragments that would directly contradict one another. I mean, they would. That's just what happens when you have people writing. If you got people and they said, oh yeah, I know, what this, I know how this, this novel goes. Oh, I know how this novel goes. And you got them together and had them say, okay, I want you to write down what you remember. I want you to write down what you remember. Guess what's going to happen? They're going to contradict each other. That wasn't in there. That was in another part. That doesn't mean that. We don't have that in the scriptures. Okay? Um, we have to remember that accuracy is lost and bias is present in translation. So we have to set aside the, uh, our, the baggage that we bring to it. Well, that's not what my preacher always told me. Well, that's, that's baggage. We've got to put that aside. We've got to go, what does the Bible mean? Not, what does your, not, not how does your preacher translate it, or what does he think about it, or what does our society think about it, or what does... We've got to put all that aside. We've got to put aside our baggage and look to the Word of God and say, what does this mean? 
Okay? Not what I think it means, but what does it mean? All right? Uh, I, I liken it to that. Um, I don't know if you've ever done this. We've done this at camp a couple of times where you got people in a circle and you whisper something into one person's ear and they're supposed to whisper it in the ear and go all the way back around the circle. By the time it gets back around, a lot of times that message has been changed. It's been lost somewhat. Well, that's not the way the word of the Lord is. It means the same now as it did. All right? Um, we're trying to understand a divine document. And we have to be open to tools that are going to help us understand it. We can't close our minds and say, no, you can't tell me anything. Uh, I know what this means, and there's nothing that you could say or do to change my mind about it. Nope. We have to be able to be open to what it means, even if it may contradict what we've always thought it meant. Uh, when, I, when somebody asked me about that idea about houses to eat and drink in, and I said, now be careful because I think you're using that scripture. I'm being nice. I said, I think you might be using that scripture incorrectly. What do you mean? I said, well, let's think about what that scripture is trying to tell us. So look at the look at the context and all this kind of stuff. And at first, it was almost a indignant. That's not, uh-uh, that's not what that means. That's not what I've always been taught. And I said, it doesn't matter what you've always been taught. It matters what the scripture means. So let's go to it. So I start looking through it, and I start reading it, and I start explaining it. I said, now, this is da-da-da-da-da-da. And all of a sudden, it was more of a grudging, well, yeah, yeah. I still don't think that we should, you know, eat and drink. It's like, that's, that's fine. That's fine. But we can't make, we got to make sure that we don't tell that as doctrine. That's not what that verse means as doctrine. Okay. So we got to be able to be open. We have to be open to what the Bible is trying to tell us. All right. Our goal here is to know, is to know, all right? What are we to know? No more and no less. No more and no less than what it means, okay? Once we find out what that a particular scripture or a particular passage or whatever that means, we can't add anything more to it. That's when it talks about adding to and taking away from scripture. Both of those are equally wrong. They're, 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 we're in error when we do that. We can't add anything more to it than there is. We can't take away anything from it than it actually means. Uh, and there's lots of ways that we could do that. I'm not going to get into a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of examples. I think you know, as well as I do, cases where people have added to the Scripture more than is actually there. And they've taken away from it and don't allow it to mean as much as it needs to mean in order to be useful to us in order for it to instruct us in the way that we're supposed to be instructed. All right? Our goal is to know no more and no less than the intended message. And when we do not understand, and I'll, get, I'll, I'll put a lot of this in there, when we do not understand the concept of Satan coming and stealing this out of our hearts, there's a concept in regards to when we do not allow it to say and mean what it means, we've allowed Satan to come in into our hearts and he steals that portion of us, that portion of our of our understanding out. He, he's active. And this is, you know, we think about the ways that Satan is active. He's just as active in the way that we study the Bible. You know, he wants us to misinterpret Scripture. He wants us to, to, to make things say that what they don't say. He wants to cause confusion to come in. You know, God doesn't want confusion, but Satan loves confusion. I think he gets, his, I think he gets more done when there's confusion than anything else. He loves it. Because now we've got these people speaking one thing, these speaking another, and what does the what is the what is what does the Christ want us to do? He wants us to all things. Yeah, we want us to speak and say the same thing. When when they come here for for when somebody comes when somebody from outside the church comes here for worship, and they hear the word of God, Satan wants nothing more than for them to go to another congregation and hear something different, hear the same scripture interpreted differently somewhere else, and they say, you see, the church can't even agree on what it means. You know, well, there's, there's the Christians for you. They can't, even, they can't even agree on anything. Listen, there's already a problem with that, isn't there? There's already a problem. People who say, I'm a, I'm a Christian, and they preach things that are completely contrary. You know, we don't speak the same thing as this XYZ denomination down the street. You know what? Satan loves that. This is confusion. I've got people confused. And when they're confused, they'll believe. They'll go, they'll do anything I tell them to do. Because you know what people want more than anything else? It's the opposite of confusion. They, want consi they do, they want consistency. They want, they want, to, they want to know, there, you know, there's a reason that people, 
you know one you want to know one of the reasons that places like um, chain restaurants do so well it's not because they have great food it's because you can go anywhere in the country and you, if you go into McDonald's here and you go to a McDonald's at the other end of the country you may not like the food but it's going to be consistent because those chains that we want consistency in our restaurant I know people who will not if when they were traveling I had a, a, a friend of mine his family when they traveled he and his mom her mom and dad when they traveled that every time they stopped, they would eat a Cracker Barrel. I like Cracker Barrel. I, I don't know if I would have wanted every single time they, I stop when I travel, but I like it. And they said, you know why they, she said, you know why they ate there? They liked the food, but it was the fact that they knew wherever they went in the country, they knew that the food was going to be consistently this way, consistently good. Not fantastic, but it was going to be consistently good. Well, people are, this, people are like that, right? Yeah, yeah. And when you've got one parent that says one thing, one parent says another, and the child knows that they can pit those parents against each other, they love it. You know, mom says no, so I'll go to dad. Dad said yes. Then all of a sudden you've got parents that are pitted against each other, and both of them think that they're equally right in the decision that they've made. And the kid knows, hey, you know what? Anytime I've got a problem, I'll just go, I'll pit one against the other. The, the whole point is this. Satan wants confusion. God wants consistency. And it's not just consistently, it's not consistently wrong. He wants it consistently correct. And when we are consistently correct in the brotherhood, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, it's not up to us to make the world believe what we believe. Okay? It's for, up for us to consistently teach the word of God correctly. All right? Uh, gets in, it, that gets into my second point. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. 2 Timothy, you probably know this one by heart. What does the scripture tell us to do? Okay, you look at, there's, there's two, there's two um, translations. Or, or, well, there's more than that. Um, handling correctly. All right. Rightly dividing. Oh, there's, those, are, those, are, those are wrong. Or they're, they're, they're inconsistent with, no, they're not. This, they mean the exact same thing. This, this idea of rightly dividing, <clears throat> uh, the concept here is, is a, it is a concept that we find, it, uh, and it's, it's through the Greek, and the idea of rightly dividing. Uh, remember, who, who, who was uh, uh, sending this message to Timothy? Who sent this message to Timothy? Paul. All right, what was Paul? An apostle, right? And what? Jew. Gen he was message to the Gentiles. What else? Did, what did he do? <clears throat> Tent maker. Okay, there's where we get our. That's where we get our idea of handling, handling rightly or rightly dividing. The idea here of rightly dividing means this: <clears throat> when you, when, when a tent maker would make a tent, you had a certain amount of cloth in order to make this tent. I, I found this fascinating. It really was. When you cut the cloth, when you, when you divided that cloth up the way it was supposed to be so that you could, you could put it together and make, make it work correctly, the idea here is basically cut it straight down the center in a, in a correct fashion. Um, it's, hard to, it's hard to describe what he's talking about without actually doing it, but it's basically cutting it straight like cloth. If, you, if, you, if you're trying to make a garment, ladies, uh, if you remember, most everybody here has used patterns and things like that. If you've got a section of cloth, and you have to make this, you know, the, the little, when you used to buy these little um, uh, uh, fabric, these patterns, and all the way, when they say, now what you need is three yards of this type of cloth. When you would go get that three types of yards of cloth, and they said, okay, now what you do is you cut this. When you started doing that, when you took your pattern out and you started putting it in, did you put it square in the center of the cloth and cut out of the center of the cloth first? No. Why? Because you've got a lot of the other pieces that you need to cut out. So you would take one piece and you put it there, and then you'd put another piece right next to it as close as possible, and you would make use of every single section of that cloth. That's basically what Paul's talking about here. When he would take that cloth and he would cut it, he would cut it perfectly down the center. And so that when he got ready to make his tent that it would have the right amount on either side. He didn't have a little portion over here and then a long portion over on the other side. The, 
it's no more, no less. Exactly what you need in order for that tent to take shape the way you want it to take shape. That's what he's talking about, the idea of rightly dividing it. Cutting it where it needs to be cut. Okay? You know, it, it talks about that. The Word of God is like a two-edged sword, right? It cuts. Cuts going and it cuts coming. Um, it, it's, it's interesting that he uses those, that terminology when he talks about the Word of the Lord. It's the same thing when we, when we rightly divide something. We use the Word of God to say no more and no less than it's supposed to mean. And when we rightly divide the Word of Truth, what are we? What are we when we rightly divide? What, is the, what, is, uh, what does he tell Timothy? Study to show thyself we're approved. And what else are we? A workman. A workman who doesn't need to be ashamed. Okay? So we handle, when we handle rightly, handling correctly the word of God, we are workmen that do not need to be ashamed because we rightly divide the word of truth. We make it say no more, no less than it's supposed to mean. We don't add our own interpretation to it. Okay. All right. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 2 Peter 3, verses 14 through 18. 2 Peter 3, 14 through 18. So these two things mean the exact same. There's no difference between them. When we handle it correctly, we are rightly dividing. All right, 2 Peter 3, 14 through 18. Whoever's got that? All right, so Peter's writing here. He's re, re, uh, he, he writes a little bit about who? Paul. Why, if you, if you look at the, what Peter says to these, these brethren, if you look at what Peter says, why is, hermeneutics, why is hermeneutics the science of interpreting important? What does he say? Paul wrote what? He wrote some things, and he says very specifically, you know, not all of the Word of God is, is straightforward and, plain, and, and in plain English. He says he wrote some things that are difficult to understand. So is there any shame in saying, I don't quite understand this. What does this mean? No. The, the worst thing you could say is, uh, you know, when, when the, I found this out. You know, you find this out in school. When the teacher says, do you have any questions? You know what? If you have any questions, when's a good time to open up your mouth and say, uh, yeah. Okay. Teachers. Aren't, don't you wish that the students that you kind of know don't understand would speak up and say, I don't understand what you're talking about? Could you please explain that in a different way or, or maybe personally? You know, come over to my, you know, maybe not everybody else, maybe everybody else understands this. I don't. Could you please come over to my table or my desk and maybe give me a little bit of more hands-on instruction or, or, or de uh, demonstrate it or give an example in some way, shape, or form? Yeah. You know, and here's Peter saying, listen, Paul's written some things that are difficult to understand. And what did he say the problem is if we don't understand them? What happens to people? What, is the, what does the scripture say? They interpret, and then what happens? They fall away. So is it important for us to interpret the word of God correctly? If it's difficult to understand. Because people will use, whether they are even whether they are well-meaning or whether they are ill-intentioned, if they're well-meaning, if they're well-meaning, they'll take that verse and trying to be of assistance, they'll make it say something that it doesn't mean. Then you've got people who are ill, uh, uh, have ill intentions towards the brotherhood, and what are they going to do? They're going to intentionally take a difficult scripture and make it and twist it to mean something that it doesn't mean. So you've got two things going on here. You've got a well-meaning brother that just it makes a mistake. Is it still a mistake? Yeah. Does it still need to be corrected? Yeah, because people are going to misunderstand something. Then you've got Satan that comes in and says, I'm going to mess this church up. I'm going to turn them every which way but loose. So this is what I want you to do. I'm going to make you take this verse, something very, so, you know it's funny? Some of the most misinterpreted scriptures are the ones that we think 
are the most obvious. Baptism. You know, how many people here, how many people here understand what it means when it says, baptism doth also now save us? Baptism is an antitype, which also doth now save us. So what do we understand by that? What saves us? You would think that would be something that would be so simple. So in its face, there it is. I mean, it says it as, as plain as day in the scriptures that baptism doth also now save us. Do you know what percentage of the religious uh, uh, organizations in this country say that baptism does not save you? Baptism does not save you. Faith saves you. <laughs> it's yeah yeah that's right that's right but you, like I said that, that verse is so I mean it's on its face it tells you exactly what you need to do in order to be saved it tells you there every example that we find in scripture says that the people heard the word of God believed it, and were baptized for the remission of their sins. Never once do we see where somebody was saved of their sins and then was baptized. Not once. But, guess what? There are those who misinterpret those scriptures. What about, you know, I had somebody say, well, there's three types of baptism, and I was baptized by the Holy Spirit. There's baptism by fire, there's baptism of the Holy Spirit, and there's baptism in water. All of these save, and I was baptized by the Holy Spirit, not by water. I don't need to because I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Of course, what you do is you, you rub your head and you rub your eyes and then you step away from the computer for a little bit and you go back and you try to make them understand a little bit better. But once again, Peter is telling them, Paul has written some things that are difficult to understand and unless we understand them, there are people who are going to take those scriptures and they're going to, they're going to misinterpret them to the damnation of their souls. That's what's going to happen. So is interpretation important? Yeah, it is. Very, 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 very important. We have to be able to do that. Um, what, is, what, is, uh, uh, what does Luke say about the, uh, in Acts chapter 17, when he writes about uh, the Bereans, what did he say about the Bereans? And what were they? He said the Bereans were more noble-minded. Why were they noble-minded? Because they searched the scriptures. Why did they search the scriptures? It wasn't just an aimless practice to prove that what they were being taught was what was being said. You know, when you say that Jesus was, this, you know, we talked about this, uh, the study that we did about the lineage of Christ. Well, why was that important? The Bereans thought it was because they wanted to make sure that this Jesus that they were claiming as was the Son of God was actually the Son of God. It means that Scripture actually proves that Jesus is the Son of God. So all these things that they were being taught, they studied the Scriptures. Well, what Scriptures? It wasn't the codified New Testament. All they had was the old law. So they were searching those Scriptures what, you know, these, these prophecies that we're being taught, were they about the Christ? Do all of the things add up to what we're being taught? Yeah. So the Bereans were noble-minded. Should we be as noble-minded as the Bereans? Yeah. We can't just rely, well, that's what my preacher taught me when I was young. We have to consistently and constantly study the Bible. We have to. If for no other reason, then we can teach somebody else. Okay, that's important, all right? Um, I'm going to give you something, and this is something that we'll, you know, we're not going to have a test. <laughs> but I, I'm going to give you something. The, this, I'm going to give you this saying. I understand. The Bible is God's timeless truth, and it is set against the timeline of history, and it is transmitted through human beings. And here we have... Theo Neustos. <laughs> I told you I'm not going to confound you with the Greek. I, I don't know Greek, okay? I, I study it when I need to in order to un understand the scriptures. I don't study Greek, all right? Theo Neustos. Theo meaning what? God. And Neustos meaning God breathed. Theonustos means that the word of God has always come from the mouth of men. When, when, you know, God told Moses what to do, right? But what did Moses have to do? He had to tell the people. 
I, I do not can't understand. A lot of people will take this to mean that God spoke to them and you know and, and spoke to them at night and they tell I want this is what I want you to tell the congregation tomorrow. That's not what happens. God does not speak to me in the dead of night and tell me what to tell everybody on Sunday morning. That's not what happens. But God has breathed the scriptures into existence. And he has done it through the mouths of men. Men wrote the Bible. Men wrote the Bible down, but God dictated the message. Okay? It is God breathed, and it came through human beings. All right, there's three difficulties that we have in hermeneutics. Three difficulties. I'm going to write these down, and we'll wind up here in just a couple minutes. One, two, and three. All right? Three difficulties we have. One is that we are separated by thousands of years. What are we separated by thousands of years? The events that took place, right? Yeah. I mean, no, none of us were around when Christ walked the earth. None of us were around when the apostles were writing these things down. None of us were around when John breathed his last breath as an apostle and went on to his reward. None of us were around during the time of Moses. None, so we are separated by thousands of years by the event, from the events in the Bible. Now, having said that, can we still read exactly what happened those thousands of years ago? Yes, we can. But it is a difficulty oftentimes when we try to interpret scriptures because we're separated by that much time. You know, it's, 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 it's very interesting. Even, you know, when you talk about, uh, I, found it, I found it really fascinating, when you talk about biographies of people who even lived 200, 300 years ago, how many different variations there are on biographies of famous, even famous people people who are in the public eye that you would think, oh, we've got all of this information, and all of a sudden you find out, hey, we didn't, everything that we thought, there's some things that we, that we didn't know that are incorrect in that, okay? So even 300 years ago, and of course these, that happens because these biographies were written by men about men, the biography that God's given us was written by God through men. But even in spite of all that, there are some difficulties involved with being separated by thousands of years. We're not familiar with the cultures, we're not familiar with all of the things that were going on. We have a best, our, our best recollection of everything like that, but there's still some difficulties by being separated by that long a period of time. All right, number two. Cultures. I'm trying to think what I got. Okay, yeah. Cultures ugh, and languages have changed. I dare say that if we went back to the first century, to the first century congregation, the, the, the assembly on Sunday morning, first day of the week, probably not, on, not in the morning, it was pro likely around noontime when they were having their meal, that was one of the problems with eating and drinking in the Lord's body. That was where that came up with. They were having a common meal before the service, and then it, all of a sudden it, it, it kind of segued into the Lord's Supper, and they're saying, no, 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 that's not what this is. It's, our Lord's Supper is not a meal. You know, it's a separate thing. But if we walked into that, in that first century uh, assembly, we likely would be, our jaws would drop. We would, have, we would be so, we would see things that were in common, but we would see things that, well, we don't do it like that. I had no idea they did that like that. For example, it, was, uh, it, it, has, been, it has been said that the first, part of the, worship, for, wor the first part of the worship service was much like we do. It was open to anybody. Anybody who would want to come in and, and participate and to listen and to uh, involve themselves in the assembly would be welcome to do that. But when it came time for the uh, uh, communion, the Lord's Supper, that would be reserved exclusively for Christians. Everybody who was not a member of the New Testament church was asked to leave while this was going on. This would be, this would be exclusive to the Lord's assembly. Okay? Well, you know, we don't do that. Matter of fact, we have people that sit here who are not members of the church, but when the plate is passed, they take a bit of that bread. Is that, is that harmful to them? No. It doesn't do them any good, but it doesn't do them any harm. But that was not like that in the first century. The idea of sitting uh, neatly in pews in an air conditioning, this is, that would be something that would be foreign to these, pe these people. So the idea of the, the cultures and the languages have changed. Okay? You think about the way our language has changed over the past several years, 20, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. There are phrases that, that we don't use anymore. There are phrases that have changed meaning altogether. You know? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you you look at um, you look at uh, the the uh, the language, the English language that was used here 300 years ago versus the English language that is used here today. I mean, it's it's just not the same. Uh, like I said, uh, catchphrases that mean something that we would have no idea. You know, back in the 20s. Uh, the young folks would talk about going out and they're going to have a gay time in the, in t- on the town tonight. Well, say that now. Say that now and see where people go, I wonder what you're talking about. <laughs> you know, it's just language changes over periods of time. It doesn't mean the same that it used to mean. Okay? Yeah, the idea of what, what those words mean, yeah. So, se- that's our second difficulty. And the last one is this. This is, and this is the one that we have to be most on guard about. Satan is always working against us. Always, always, always. He does not stop. He does not rest. He doesn't have to. Um, there was a movie a long time ago about... Uh, it's called Ter- the Terminator, and it was the idea that there was this machine that was built, and it was sent back in time to assassinate somebody so that their child could not be born. And one of the things that this, this guy that was sent back to, to rescue this person said, you don't understand, it will not stop, it will not eat, it will not sleep, it will not rest until it's a, a purpose has been accomplished. Well, we can look at Satan the same way. He doesn't sleep. Satan doesn't sleep. You know, when we're safely in our beds at night, he's working on the other side of the world to accomplish everything that he wants to accomplish. When we wake up in the morning, it starts all over again. He does not, he does not rest. He does not eat. He does not sleep. He will not stop until his purpose is accomplished. And, and, and I know that for a lot of people, it's like, well, you know, we never get any rest. No, we don't. That's what we're working towards is an eternal rest. We don't take our rest here. So Satan is always working against us. He wants um, uh, confusion to creep in, and there we are. All right, I'm going to stop there. And we'll get in started in this uh, next week. Three guides to the exegete, which is what we are supposed to be, is exegetical. We take the meaning out, and we're going to talk about three guides to being that, and then we'll get into uh, the rest of the, uh, the uh, study, second course of study. Any questions? Any questions? All right. I'm hoping that this will be interesting. Uh, I think it will be because we're going we're gonna to talk about ways that we can get better at what we're doing. And I think that when we find that when we're better at what we're doing, we're more excited about it. When we get good about it, we get excited. I know something that I didn't know before. So I'm hoping we'll do that. Uh, we want to offer the invitation as we always do. We want to invite anyone who needs to uh, avail themselves of the, uh, the prayers of the church. We want to do that if you need uh, our, our prayers on your behalf or anybody, whatever your need might be. We invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.